Good morning. My name is Yolanda Jackson. I'm currently the chair of the Social and Environmental Justice Committee. And our opening words today are from Jason Cook. We seekers are on a quest, a quest to discover truth and meaning. Sometimes we think we found it, wrapped up, glimmering with newness, straight off the intellectual assembly line. All the answers are right here for us and others, if they'd only listen. But truth has a way of coming in disguise, sometimes wearing rags and sometimes finery, but so often cloaked from our immediate sight. And sometimes that which we have rejected, that which we have let go of, or decided was only for others, but not us, can be our teacher. Let our time of worship be an acknowledgement of the never ending journey towards truth and meaning, and our appreciation of those we learn from along the way. Our gathering music this morning is Song of the Six Doors by Jesse Grease. Song of the Six Sources. and I am honored to serve as the Minister of the Unitarian Universalists of Central Delaware and to welcome you again to worship this morning. We're so glad that you are here. We hope that you will find ample room in this community for your spirit. We are talking today about the six sources of Unitarian Universalism and hope that you'll hear echoes of that throughout the service. Want to let you know that in addition to our worship each Sunday at 10, we meet on Tuesday nights at 7 for a more informal time of check-in and sharing and hope that you'll consider joining us for that gathering. By way of announcements this morning, I'll let you know that our monthly board of trustees meeting is tomorrow evening at 6.30 and that will be a hybrid meeting. And so there will be people gathering at Congreg Congregation Beth Shalom at 6.30 for that meeting and others who are joining by Zoom, you could uh, join us for either of those. If you need more information, that's in the email or you can contact me. Also want to let you know that next Sunday afternoon at 3 p.m. at the Unitarian Universalists of Southern Delaware in Lewis, they are installing their newest minister, the Reverend Heather Ryan Starr. And that's um, something that you can also join by live stream. I'm going to post the link here in case you are interested in it. And now as we prepare ourselves for worship, let's take a deep breath and a moment of silence together. 
as we remember whoever you are, whomever you love, wherever you've been, whatever you've done, whatever your religious beliefs are or aren't, you're welcome in this spiritual community. However you move in this world, how much or how little is in your bank account or wallet, whatever you carry with you into this time that we share, you and all of who you are are welcome in the spiritual community. We're all enhanced by being together. Good morning, I'm Kelly Blanchies. I'll be leading the chalice lighting. We seek our place in the world and the answers to our heart's deep questions. As we seek, may our hearts be open to unexpected answers. May the light of our chalice remind us that this is a community of warmth, of wisdom, and welcome of multiple truths. And now it's time for our affirmation. The words are in the chat box. Love is the spirit of this church and service its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love and to help one another. Please sing along in your own environment with our opening song, Voice Still and Small, number 391 in our hymnal, Words and Music by John Corrado. This version is from Reverend Christopher Watkins Lamb. Kristen Martin and I'm doing the UU moment today. Each week at UU CD, we include a brief UU moment in our worship service that serves to make us aware of and to nurture our connection to the larger body of Unitarian Universalists and the Unitarian Universalist Association that binds us together. Today, we take a cue from one of UUA's Tapestry of Faith programs a curriculum for children called Love Will Guide Us. This program guides children to approach life's questions, mysteries, and dilemmas through the lens of UU sources, which 
it puts into kids' language as follows. The sense of wonder we all share, the wise people of long ago and today whose lives remind us to be kind and fair, the ethical and spiritual wisdom of the world's religions, Jewish and Christian teachings, which tell us to love all others as we love ourselves, the use of reason and the discoveries of science, the harmony of nature and the sacred circle of life, our seventh source, examples of faithful belief and action from our Unitarian and Universalist heritage. Next in the order of service is the story for all ages, The Girl with Big, Big Questions by Brittany Wynn Lee. There once was a girl with twinkling eyes and a very curious mind. This girl was always asking questions whose answers weren't easy to find. The world is so very interesting, she wanted to learn all she could, from what makes a plane stay in the sky to what makes each person good. Her days were filled with adventures galore, since her mind was so full of wonder. How long can a turtle stay in its shell? Why doesn't lightning come before thunder? Why can't people live on the moon? What happens to stars when they fall? When will you let me stay up all night? Why even have bedtime at all? What does the dog do while I'm at school? Hey, how was the whole world made? And why do we have big hearts that can feel hurt and upset and afraid? Could I fly if I got a good running start? The nearest volcano is where? Are monsters real? What's Spanish for blue? Is it okay to cut my own hair? From the moment she opened her eyes for the day to the time she was tucked into bed, she'd ask and ask and ask and ask every question that popped in her head. At first, her neighbors, teachers, and friends tried to answer her wonder-filled mind, but after a while, their encouraging smiles were replaced by the rolling of eyes. She noticed her questions were making them tense, and one day her class hit their limit. After she asked a dozen things about clouds, the class hollered, please stop, just quit it, stop. Embarrassed, the girl tried to quiet her thoughts and not raise a voice so curious so that no one would be too uncomfortable or even worse, furious. But one day she found the nest of a bird built low and exposed near the ground. Why would a nest not be in a tree, she wondered and then looked around. She was all by herself with no one to ask, so she ran to the library shelves. She read about cities and the lack of safe places for birds to build nests for themselves. Like hunting for treasure, she searched and learned more answers that made her frown. With an urgent report, she announced to her class, there are not enough trees in our town. The class, now moved by this information, asked questions about how to embark on a project to help both the birds and their neighbors by planting more trees in their parks. The girl knew then that big questions are good and answers aren't just things to know. They are things to discover alongside each other. Asking questions is how we all grow. That is the end of the girl with big, big questions. Good morning. I'm Rose Ackerman. And now it's time for joys and concerns. We offer one another the opportunity to share very briefly what's most on our hearts right now, life's celebrations and concerns. As you do so, we invite you to light a candle in your own space through the action of sharing and kindling a flame. We give energy to our best thoughts, meditation, sympathy, celebrations, and prayers. We hold these sacred in our collective hearts. 
we would also like to invite anyone who's new or visiting us today to introduce yourselves as you would like to. We welcome you warmly and would be pleased to light a candle in your honor of your connection with you, whatever joys and concerns you may carry in your heart. At this time, we invite you to change your view to gallery view up in the upper right hand corner of your screen so that you can see everyone who's here. As you feel led, please unmute your microphone and share your joy or your concern and light a candle if you have one. You can watch the mute signals on the lower left of each person's video stream, see if anyone else is about to speak. It is best if we share one at a time. Please mute yourself after you've spoken. We light one final candle for the joys and concerns that were not spoken by those of us here today and in solidarity with the, our others in our community who could not be with us. Good morning, I'm Tom Gower. I'm the website administrator for UUCD. As Unitarian Universalists, the central part of our worship, both in person and online, is the opportunity we all have to practice the art of generosity and the spiritual practice of gratitude. Our gifts to our congregations are what allow our communities to live into our calling and mission. We are grateful to you for the many gifts and ways you support our community including your financial pledges and offerings. Your gifts matter, and it's one of the ways that you make this world a better place. For those of you who are making pledges or who want to contribute to UUCD, please visit uucd.org and click on Support UUCD for more information about how to donate online and by mail. For March, our Share the Partner our Share the Plate partner is the DIMH, the Dover Interfaith Mission for Housing. All undesignated donations will be sent to DIMH as our congregation's contribution as we continue to support and build partnerships with like-minded organizations making our community a better place. While you're doing that, we'll play our offertory music, which today is Strength, Courage, and Wisdom by Indian Ari. This is a song we wanted to do during this quarantine time to remind all of ourselves that have whatever it takes to make it. We can adapt. It's been inside of you all along. Inside my head there lives a dream that I want to see in the sun. Behind my eyes there lives a me that I've been hiding for much too long. Cause I've been afraid to let it show cause I'm scared of the judgment that may follow always putting off my living for tomorrow it's time to step out on faith I gotta show my face it's been elusive for so long but freedom is mine today I gotta step out on faith time to show my face Procrastination had me down, but look what I have found. I found strength, courage, and wisdom, and it's been inside of me all along. Strength, courage, and wisdom inside of me. <laughs> it's my jam. <laughs> My pride there lives in me that knows humility. Inside my voice there is a soul, and in my soul there is a voice. But I've been 
too afraid to make a choice Cause I'm scared of the things that I might be missing Running too fast to stop to listen Time to step out on faith I gotta show my face It's been elusive for so long But freedom is mine today Step out on faith It's time to show my face Procrastination had me down But look what I have found I found strength, courage, and wisdom it's been inside of me all along. Strength, courage, and wisdom inside of me. that I want to see Cause I know now that I've opened up my heart I know that anything I want can be morning is actually one of my very favorite readings. Um, it's by Sof <clears throat> Sophia Lyon Foz, who was a groundbreaking Unitarian religious educator who died in 1978 at the age of 102. I think it's incredibly appropriate for the kind of ideological um, war that is going on right now. It, <clears throat> it's entitled, It Matters What We Believe. Some beliefs are like walled gardens. They encourage exclusiveness and the feeling of being especially privileged. Other beliefs are expansive and lead the way into wider and deeper sympathies. Some beliefs are like shadows, clouding children's days and fears of unknown calamities. Other beliefs are like sunshine, blessing children with the warmth of happiness. Some beliefs are divisive, separating saved from unsaved, friends from enemies. Other beliefs are bonds in a world community where sincere differences beautify the pattern. Some beliefs are like blinders, shutting off the power to choose one's own direction. Other beliefs are like gateways, opening wide vistas for exploration. 
Some beliefs weaken a person's selfhood. They blight the growth of resourcefulness. Other beliefs nurture self-confidence and enrich the feeling of personal worth. Some beliefs are rigid, like the body of death, impotent in a changing world. Other beliefs are pliable, like the young sapling, ever growing with the upward thrust of life. So how many of you have ever been with a toddler who has discovered the wonderful word, why? I imagine all of you at some time and some of you for uh, years at a time. It can be fun, can't it, when young ones begin to curiously probe their world and try to understand what they can about the great mysteries of life. Asking why? over and over and over again for hours upon hours because the questions are so many, so big, and so important. It starts when we are very young that we want to know more about the world, the creatures around us, the wonder of nature, what it means to be good people, how to love, how to do the right thing, what's the meaning of life, all the big, big questions. Well, this morning we're going to be reflecting on a question that is essential in this kind of search for wisdom and understanding. And that is this question, or this series of questions. Where do we look for answers? To whom do we listen? And do we listen to them all the time or just under certain circumstances? How do we know what we know? In spiritual communities, this is a theological question, perhaps the most foundational theological question there is, with whom or what do we consult when we are looking for truths? Who or what can be trusted? What are the sources of our knowing? Who or what are the religious or ethical authorities that help us navigate the world as good people? When I was growing up, people in my rural Oklahoma town used to answer this question with a bumper sticker. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Well, in my experience, what that sticker really meant was something more like, I already think it, I found something in the Bible I think backs me up, and if you don't agree with me, you might as well not bother saying anything because I'll not be changing my mind anyway. And you know, that sticker also begs the deeper question, which I always ask, how do you know what God says anyway? And they would answer in that context, of course, the Bible. The, the Bible is the word of God. It was made clear to me in my Bible-believing Baptist church as a very small child that we were supposed to look to the Bible as the ultimate source of religious authority. It was made clear to me also, as a younger child anyway, that asking questions about the Bible or its truthfulness was strictly verboten. The image that I have in my mind of how I was taught to read the Bible or respond to religious authority more generally is an image of a dashboard dog stuck in a perpetual state of nodding, right? Unquestioning assent compliant orthodoxy or rightness of belief. Now for me and billions of other people, that way of reading the Bible can quickly become unsatisfying, especially if that big good book has ever been used against you as a weapon. Because of that Bible abuse, often coupled with an observation of the hypocrisy of so-called believers, Many people grow skeptical about or even resistant to anything that comes from the Bible and they throw it out as a source of authority like the proverbial baby with the bathwater. And I get that impulse, I've been there. Religious scholar Marcus Borg talks about the ways in which people read the Bible or whatever their written sources of authority are by saying that there's an early pre-critical naivete that people have when it's 
easy just to accept the things that we're taught without questioning. When believing the stories of our traditions is easy and doesn't really even require faith. That's the first stage of relating to a source of religious authority. But it almost always moves into another stage once someone begins critical thinking, when they start asking why and associated questions like, well, if God made the world, then who made God? Or if there were no other people in the land, where did Cain and Abel find their wives? Or it's really just not possible for a fish to swallow a person and have them survive. Or virgins simply do not get pregnant. Right? Once critical thinking enters in, it becomes clear that either that source of religious authority is inadequate, and perhaps one rejects it entirely, or it's meant to be engaged in a different kind of way than we may have thought. And if one takes that path very far, not of rejection, but critical engagement, well, Borg says that they move into a different stage of relationship with the sources of their religious tradition. And he calls that stage post-critical naivete. When one has the ability to accept different kinds of truths, one's not equated with facts or not rooted in the idea that scriptures, by whatever name, are always literal or infallible. I can remember the season in my life when my own relationship with the Bible shifted in that way, when I felt confident enough to read it in a posture quite different from a dashboard dog, when I thought to myself, you know, maybe reacting in revulsion to a scripture that says we should dash the heads of babies against rocks is the right reaction. Maybe we're supposed to object when the Bible becomes a weapon that harms and people who claim to speak for God abuse and exclude the very neighbors they're supposed to love. Maybe we should scrunch our eyes and shake our heads when things don't sound right. Or to use a metaphor from the Hebrew Bible itself, maybe the blessing, maybe the wisdom comes precisely during and because of our wrestling with or against those kind of texts. Maybe truth is discovered not in the text at all, but in us through our interaction with them. That was a liberating leap for me. So you can imagine how much more liberating it was to discover the Unitarian Universalist sources document. It was the first and only time that I felt like I could nod along consciously on purpose in agreement with the church's stated ideas about where to look for spiritual and ethical guidance. In 1985, the UUA revised our original statement of purposes that happened when the Unitarians and Universalists merged in 61. It was revised to include what we now know of as the UU principles and sources. A major impetus for the revision of those UU statements was the insistence of women that we eliminate the use of sexist or exclusionary language in our bylaws in such phrases as the dignity of man or the constant use of the pronoun he. That's your women's history tidbit for the day. But there were also two other major conversations happening at that same time in the process of revising the bylaws that led to where we are today. First, the conviction that other religious traditions besides Judaism and Christianity are also important to our heritage. And second, that our relationship to our environment, the earth, is one of our primary religious concerns. Now, quite amazingly, for any religious group um, that's revising bylaws, especially statements about what we believe together, um, amazingly, especially for a UU group, those revisions were passed nearly unanimously and have remained the same for many years even as we revise or revisit them from time to time because of our living tradition, we still promote and affirm these six sources of wisdom and spirituality. And I know you know them already, but hear them again. 
that these things can be counted on as sources of wisdom. Direct experience of that transcending mystery and wonder affirmed in all cultures, which moves us to a renewal of the spirit and an openness to the forces which create and uphold life. Words and deeds of prophetic people, which challenge us to confront powers and structures of evil with justice, compassion, and the transforming power of love. Wisdom from the world's religions, which inspires us in our ethical and spiritual life. Jewish and Christian teachings, which call us to respond to God's love by loving our neighbors as ourselves. Humanist teachings, which counsel us to heed the guidance of reason and the results of science and warns us against idolatries of the mind and spirit. And spiritual teachings of earth-centered traditions which celebrate the sacred circle of life and instruct us to live in harmony with the rhythms of nature. Isn't that a wonderfully expansive description of the many sources available for our spirituality? For me, it, it really is. And one of the most important expansions about what is a legitimate source of religious truth and authority is that which includes and honors personal experience as a primary source of our knowing. Some religious traditions have used suspicion or denigration of the individual's own experience as a way of keeping people in their place. It's a control strategy, an effective one. But when people, and especially marginalized people, voiceless people, when people aren't deterred by that, when folks honor their own experience and their own capacity for reason, they may well find answers to the big, big questions in a place where some authorities don't want us to look. There is an ancient Greek legend that when the gods made the human species, they started arguing about where to put the answer to life so that humans would have to search for them. And one god said, let's put the answers on top of a mountain. They'll never look for them there. No, said the others, they'll find them right away. So another of the gods said, let's put them in the center of the earth. They'll never look for them there. Nah, said the others, they'll find them right away. Then another spoke, let's put them at the bottom of the sea. They'll never look for them there. No, said the others, they'll, they'll find them there right away. And silence fell and they stayed in the silence for a moment until another God spoke and said, we can put the answers to life within them they will never look for them there. And so they did. So the legend goes. But the point is that we have an important source of knowledge, as well as a basic model BS filter already inside us. That's why Walt Whitman, whom we love to claim as one of our ancestors, wisely encouraged us, re-examine all that you've been told in school or church or in any book and dismiss what insults your very soul. We can trust ourselves much more than certain others would have us believe. And the spiritual quest is about more than our own experience. Both things are true. It's often joked about that to be Unitarian Universalist means you can believe in anything or nothing. And while that may technically be true, it misses one of the primary reasons that we are who we are and that we do what we do as congregations and communities of faith. We care about truth and one another. We are genuinely looking for ways to get the most out of life. We want to know how to be better people and how to engage in collaborative actions that will make the world better for everyone. And we do it together because the spiritual journey, the quest for truth and meaning, the striving to live in love until we get there is done best in community. In his book, A Hidden Wholeness, The Journey to an Undivided Life, Parker Palmer comments on the ways in which our individual and communal spiritual journeys converge in the places where we support and refine one another. 
he notes that, of course, solitude is essential to personal integration because there are places in the landscapes of our lives where no one can accompany us. But because we are communal creatures who need each other's support, and because left to our own devices, we have an endless capacity for self-absorption and self-deception, community is equal, equally essential. That kind of spiritual community, which I experience as being aspirational for most UU congregations, Parker says that that kind of community supports rather than supplants the individual quest for integrity. And it does that supporting the individual quest rooted in two basic beliefs. First, that we all have an inner teacher whose guidance is more reliable than anything we can get from a doctrine, theology, ideology, collective belief system, institution, or leader. And second, we all need other people to invite, amplify, and help us discern that inner teacher's voice. So it's important, as I said earlier, that we reclaim belief in and reliance upon our best inner teacher, that wisdom that lives in our own hearts and minds. And it's vital that we do this together in conversation and community with other sources of wisdom because our own perspective is always limited. It only shows part of the picture. I know you'll be familiar with one of the most prominent metaphors for describing this phenomenon. The earliest texts for the story exist in Buddhist and Hindu scriptures, but it's also present in Sufi and Baha'i lore. And it's that story of the blind men and the elephant, right? It usually goes something like this. A group of blind men heard that a strange animal called an elephant had been brought to the town, but none of them have heard of such a thing and weren't aware of what its shape and form might be. So out of curiosity, they said, let's go and inspect it by touch. Let's experience it for ourselves. And so they sought it out. And when they found it, they groped about it. The first person whose land, a hand landed on the trunk said, well, this being is like a thick snake. For another one whose hand reached its ear, it seemed like a kind of fan. For another person whose hand was upon its leg, they said the elephant is a pillar, like a tree trunk, solid. The one who placed their hand upon its side said the elephant is most assuredly a wall. Another felt its tail and described it as a rope. The last felt its tusk and said the elephant is that which is hard, smooth, and like a spear. Now the details change, but regardless of the details in the story, the blind people learned that they were all partially correct and all partially wrong. The moral of the story is that while one's subjective personal experience is true, it may not be the totality of truth. It is important, it's an important part of the picture, but not the whole picture. Whatever our backgrounds, as Unitarian Universalists, we are part of a living tradition. We look to a number of perspectives, a variety of sources, ancient and contemporary, that in combination and in community can help us on our search for truth and meaning, can give us insights into the purpose of life and our place in it. I want to close by reading you a poem by Nancy Schaefer, again, something that you may know already. Uh, it's a uniquely you, you kind of poem. And it's called For Margaret, Who Fights the Same Battle Over and Over. And she writes, listen, when you quarrel with God, really, you're quarreling with those who've come after God. It is not God who taught you only a certain prayer or said reward lies in only one direction. It is not God who said reward rather than embracing love, which is everywhere. Not God who told you to hate God or shun God. Those like you, two-legged and mortal, did this. Those also hurt in turn by others before them. 
but you could leave off this quarreling. Just begin again with just yourself and God. You can choose a different name for the holy. Stop cringing when I say mine. Each is only a word for what can't be said, the barest beginning, a glimpse. The rest you may do in private. But see, what you do there in private shows. What you come back with is written all over you. It doesn't matter what that particular word is, only that you return there often, opening yourself to everything that makes it. Those who taught you what to pray and how to pray were wrong if what they taught you, you hate. You can begin again. I love this poem because it reclaims the human freedom and capacity to do our own searching, to let go of toxic religiosity that would have us hate ourselves or anyone else, and to follow whatever path it is, whatever paths they are, that lead us to wisdom, wholeness, kindness, love, and justice. May we begin again our journeys of spiritual discovery with a renewed sense of openness to the sources of inspiration that call and guide us to a more just and verdant world. May it be so. Our closing song this morning is Be Ours a Religion. The text is by Theodore Parker and the music by Tom and Thomas Benjamin. And this version is led by the First Unitarian Church of Baltimore. Be ours a religion which like sunshine goes everywhere its temple space its shine the good heart its creed all truth its ritual works so join me in extinguishing the chalice. The words are in the chat box. 
We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Our closing words this morning are from James Morrison. Within each of our hearts, there is a most glorious light. Go forth and let its spark help you understand what troubles both you and others. Go forth and let its light of reason be a guide in your decisions. Go forth and bring its ray of hope to those in need of help in both body and spirit that they may find healing. Go forth and fan the flames of passion to help heal our world. Go forth and spread the warm glow of love. Go forth and share your glorious light with the world.